right? She appreciate that, Brother Dalton, tonight. If you need a handout tonight, if you lift your hand up for a handout, as we continue in our series, The Top Ten Ways to Ruin Your Children. And tonight, I think the principle that we bring will not just be applicable for parents, but in some ways for all of us. But if you need a handout again, uh, make sure these young men down here get one for sure. They need that. Yep, especially Landon right there. But if you need a handout, lift your hand up. The ushers will come around there. Top 10 ways to ruin your children. If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 127 as we look at that passage again tonight. Thank you, men, for handing those out for us. Of course, in that handout as well, you'll see a current prayer sheet, and make sure you lift up the folks in church in prayer and praying for one another. One of the marks, uh, one of the uh, characteristics of a church is that the members pray for each other. Now, we're supposed to pray for one another, and so we provide that information. If you want the full list, you can go online to two, the number 2fbc.com slash prayer, and, but we'll give that sheet. It should be in that handout as well. So keep those hands up while they bring you those handouts for the top 10 ways to ruin your children. Tonight we're on the third, the third way. I did not even bother to include the fourth way on the handout tonight. I thought there is no way I'm getting there, so there's no sense even taking up space on that one tonight. If I get done early and fly through this one, we'll just get out early. But you've been here long enough to know that's probably not going to happen, all right? So don't hold your breath. Though, I have found if you can't be good, you can be short, right? No one argues with a short sermon. And so, but if you're neither good nor short, then we're here in our series. So that's where we're at. So Psalm 127, you have your Bibles. Psalm 127, it's also in your handout. We see three verses at the top, at the top there that kind of provide the framework for our instructions as parents and God's view, parents to children. I realize that in this auditorium, we have a vast array of different uh, life stages from a teenager to a grandparent, we have a single, we have married, we have a, an all in between. Some with kids, some with young kids, some with old kids out of the house, all in there. And I hope that these lessons uh, will help and, and be a help to you. If not necessarily to your exact situation, maybe you know someone that it could be a help along the way. Some of you have mentioned to me that, that while you may not be in this life stage, you thought of someone that it could be, that it could be helpful to, and you directed them to the YouTube uh, page or to Facebook there. They can watch that in the, uh, um, after the service. So if that can be helpful to somebody, then that's what we try to do here at First Baptist Church and bring the Bible. Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4, where the Bible says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. All right, children are from God. Children are from God. Children were not man's idea or woman's idea. I think it's a good idea. I love my children. Most days. If you're honest as parents, you would agree with me most days. No, I, 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 I probably better this way. I love my children. I like them most days. All right, I always love them. I like them most days. There are those moments when they act like me, and that's when I just... I am uh, humbled by the fact that they would pick up on all my bad characteristics. And that is how, again, how I, I got this list. I just looked at what I did and said, oh, boy, that's a mistake. We'll write that one down. The Bible says, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. They are be pointed to be used in, in that illustration of a man who is accomplishing something, and our application as parents, they are to be pointed and directed in the right direction. Throughout these series, I want to be a help to you. And as we look at the Word of God, I believe these things will. I'm going to say some things that apply to you even without children. All right, you can take those things. And um, I'll probably along the way say something that you don't agree with. A few weeks back, I was up on cell phones. I realize that some of you disagree with me 1,000%, if that's even possible, on cell phones. And that is fine, but I would ask that you approach it with a biblical perspective. Amen. Can we do that? And uh, understand as I bring these things, um, I'm trying to bring a biblical, a biblical foundation. If you have questions along the way, don't be afraid to reach out and ask me. All right, reach out and ask. If I can't answer it, or answer it, I'll just ask my wife. I'm sure she can answer it. Um, remember, as we, as we go through these series, there are four principles that I want you to remember. And each week I'm going to go over these four principles. Number one, first principle, very few people are trying to ruin their children. Very few parents are trying to ruin their children. But even though very few are trying to ruin them, just remember that many more are accomplishing the fact of ruining them than are trying. And I'm not just talking um, out in society, I'm talking inside of a church setting as well. 
but very few are actually trying to ruin them. I, I don't know of very many parents, if any here, that get up in the morning and say, listen, today my goal is to ruin my children. Second principle, we are all going to make mistakes. If the mark or if the uh, qualification for perfect children is perfect parenting, then we are all hopelessly lost because none of our children will ever have nor have had perfect parents save Adam and Eve. And they still decided to do, to do wrong. Not an excuse, just from the Bible. So we're very few people are trying to ruin their children. We are all going to make mistakes. Third principle, we must realize our incorrect tendencies, actions, and attitudes and make corrections. Let me put it simply. If you learn something from God's word tonight, then apply it tonight. That's what I mean by that. If, if the Lord prompts your heart, say, listen, this needs to change, then change it. Then have the humility to change it. Say, listen, I was doing this, I should be doing this. The fourth principle, God brings practical truth and help from scripture to our parenting. We believe that God's word is profitable. All scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. So as we build these particular lessons, I'll give you a way, I'll give you some deceptive thoughts and then a correct response and bring some, some truth from God's word. God's word is practical for our life inside of our parenting and kids. All right, so the third principle tonight, um, as, we, as we begin, if you want to ruin your kids, then set the wrong priorities in your family. Then set the wrong priorities in your family. As we go through these priorities tonight and some of the foundation for it, I believe that beyond the family aspect and application, all of us struggle with priorities in life. What gets first place? What gets our attention in life? I'd like to believe, I'd like to think that I always have God number one. But maybe you have some of the same struggles that I have in that other things want to crowd out God in my life. Other things seem to compete for the top spot. But maybe you have that struggle, just life happens. And all of a sudden you realize that something is trying to crowd out your Savior, your God, who is supposed to have the preeminence. Well, I believe if you set the wrong priorities, you are well on your way to ruining your children. Lord, help us tonight as we look at your word and look at this, uh, this concept tonight. Lord, I pray you'd guide me. Help me to say those things that would be helpful. Help me to say those things that are true to your word. And Lord, I pray that in areas uh, that you convict us and correct us that we would change. Lord, help us to have an open mind and open heart to you and your word. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. We have your notes there tonight. I'd like to give you a thought. Families are trying to prioritize too many things. I could broaden that statement and put it this way. People are trying to prioritize too many things. They're trying to make too many things number one. In our life, we can only have one thing be the priority. Now, it may at a time. It may be different things at different times, but only one thing at a time can have the top place. We cannot have 35 top places. We can have one. We can have one. And the goal, the point of the night, is to make sure that God is number one. It's in a sense, the theme for this year, only God. Again, bring it back down to a family and a life situation. We see situations where families put families over God. Where families put families over God. Where they say, you know what? Uh, instead of worshiping God at church, we will have a family night. Now, I am all for a family night. At our house, we have family nights. Typically on a Friday night. Not every Friday night. Um, often there are things going on, but a family night at our house, the kids get to pick the menu, and they kind of pick the activity, unless mom and dad overrule. <laughs> nice little caveat right there, right? That means the Howell house isn't always a democracy, just so you know. Um, everyone gets an equal vote until dad and mom vote. Uh, but we have family night. The kids look forward to it, I think, and they enjoy it. And, uh, but, but it is not an either-or competition. I'm not going to have a family night 
on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock when church is going on. But I know and aware of families who prioritize family over God and the things and worship of God. Uh, sometimes people will prioritize sports over God. What does that look like, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Well, Pastor, I couldn't make it to church Sunday night because the Lions were still playing. Now, let me help you. Let me help you. They lost. I wish it were different. I wish it were not so. Right? But if it is, and it is, um, I will tell you so. Uh, no, it, it, sports over family, or, or, or sports over God. You know that my kids um, have had the opportunity to play some, some sports in a travel sport team setting. I tried, we, well, didn't try, we told them early on, those will never take the place of church. Well, let me translate that for you just a little bit. That means that church always takes priority over my boys playing soccer. I told the coaches early on this was a situation. They said, well, they asked us to play. They said, can, can your boys play? And I said, well, just so you know, we have church. Okay, when is it? I said, well, it's Sunday morning and uh, Sunday night and Wednesday night. They said, you have a lot of church. <laughs> so I, said, I said, yeah. I said, we also have special services in there too. I said, it could be a random schedule. And they said, okay. Well, they, then they said this, that's no problem. I said, all right, as long as it's no problem. I said, I don't want to be an uncommitted parent, but um, if they're going to play this, and we're happy for them to do this right now, we may not do it forever, I said, uh, just know that we'll never, we'll never miss church for that. And um, as long as you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. Told the, the boys, told the family at that point, if there's ever one tear shed, we're done. Now, we're not a perfect family. I would never present that. I've said that each week. I'm not a perfect father, perfect mother. No way. But in our family, I wanted to teach the boys um, that you can still enjoy a sport, but God is more important than that. More important than that. Um, it's interesting, uh, going into it, I, I was informed that there's no way they would move. There's no way that there'd always be opportunities that, that we'd have to cancel this and that. I've heard, these, I've heard these, these stories and counts. Our experience was different with our particular teams. The Lord is gracious to us and, and, and didn't have to do this, but it's now to the point um, in fact, this when the spring season started, um, both the coaches for my boys contacted me. And they said, uh, they said, Pastor, um, here are the game schedule. Will this work with church? And I said, yes, yes, no, yes. I said, we'll get that changed, no problem. Now, I didn't go in that way and say, let's, this is the way it must be. I'm telling you, I'm a Christian, I'm a Baptist pastor. You better move these games first or I'm not playing that soccer ever again. I didn't come in that way. All right? And if it didn't work, that's fine. But sports are not more important than church. Never, not any day of the week. But sometimes it seems like people prioritize sports over, over church. Well, I can catch it online. You can catch it online. You can. You can watch me preach online. But you're now showing which one is more important by which one you're going to be live at. How about this? Well, we'll make sure that we defend each other even if it means we don't have a biblical response. Let me flush this out for you. Well, I told that person that if they said that again, then my kid can punch them. And if they punch them, well, that's okay, Principal Howell, because I told them they could. Okay. Just one question, my friend. Show me that response in the Bible. Just show me where the Bible says you can punch them. I would beg you to show me that response. I'd like it sometimes. Or my flesh would like it sometimes. Wouldn't yours? Now don't look at me like I'm pagan up here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. There are those times where you're like, I wish that I could just let my flesh go right now. And I wish that whole soft answer, turn away wrath, wasn't in the scripture. Lord, just strike that right out. In fact, instead of a soft answer, a swift left jab followed by a strong right uppercut will turn away wrath and cease from strife. I wish that's what my Bible said, right? Yet we prioritize our family in defense of each other 
over a biblical response. I want to give us a few thoughts inside of this. There's some deceptive thoughts that creep in inside of this. And the danger in this is that our children will learn that God is not most important, but everything else is. And maybe you're able to still balance and have a walk with God, but if we're not careful, if we give this example to our children, and even as church members, to others, and they follow that and flush that out, they will end up not having God as priority. And the Bible clearly commands that. Let's look at some deceptive thoughts tonight. Number one, the first deceptive thought, I am my highest priority. You say, well, pastor, I would never think that. Well, I would submit, I would argue, that we often live life this way. We live life based on how we feel. What do you want to eat? Whatever I feel like. I'm not saying it's bad that you eat what you feel like. I'm just saying you will start to pattern your life based on how you feel. I will go to bed when I feel like it. I'll wake up when I feel like it. I'll do this if I feel like it. I'll do this task if I feel like it. And all of a sudden, you have now asserted yourself as the highest priority. Now, if I want to do this, I will. And if I don't, I won't without any regard for God's plans, desires, thoughts, and instructions. Now, the life lived these ways may at times appear to be similar. A life pattern after God may still go to McDonald's and get French fries. But they are fundamentally different. On a base level, on a foundational spiritual level, someone who is basing their life on how they feel will ultimately end with contention and strife and turmoil because they are promoting themselves to be the top. That means the Holy Spirit is not guiding them. They're not going to have the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and long-suffering and temperance and patience. They won't have these things. Someone who lives life this way says, in a sense, I am my greatest guide. I am the first place in my life. I am the sole authority in my life. It means I'm living life based on how I feel. And I'm afraid, moms and dads and kids, that's often how we live. The question will come, can I do this? And dad's in a bad mood. Dad's in a bad mood. No. No, you can't. Don't ask again. Never. Done. Dad's in a good mood. Yes. Yes, you can. So kids learn very quickly, well, in order for me to get a yes, I have to make sure dad is happy. Because he's in a bad mood, he's not going to think with wisdom and discretion and think spiritually. He's just going to react in his flesh. You say, kids don't process all that. No, they don't, might not process the background, but they know how it flushes out, don't they? Ooh, they walk in the house, oh, dad's not happy. Hey, dad, you want a Diet Coke? What do you want? Shows are used to watching us react with a me first priority. Well, I know that if I don't clean my room today, my mom will, I can tell she's going to bite my head off. I know that mom's going on a tangent today. That's living, living life based on how we feel. The parents talking to the kids. Kids, young people, teenagers, you're not careful, you will live life how you feel. Wake up in the morning and you're cranky, you have a bad day all day. I could tell as principal when kids were living life how they felt. You walk in, you just see the storm cloud over the head coming down right through those front doors. Down their locker, locker slams. It's going to be a great day, great day. That's living life how you feel. That is saying... I am my highest priority. And whatever affects me, that is how I live. That is how I make decisions. That is how I will treat people without any regard for God and Scripture. See the danger in that? You see the application? Do you see the, convic the conviction in that? 
if we're honest, we often live a life, if we're honest, struggle with living life how we feel. Number two, others have this deceptive thought. My family is my first priority. My family is my first priority. Moms and dads will, will interpret this idea differently, but both will struggle with this. Some way it flushes out, well, spending, uh, spending time with them, spending time with them, that's my highest priority. As dads, well, providing for them, that's my highest priority. Let me pause there real quick. There's a verse in the second, uh, or first Timothy, 5 verse 8. This is one that's often quoted in this situation. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of, the, of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And a dad will take that verse and say, listen, I must provide for my family over anything else or I am worse than an infidel. Now, I do believe that it, there's a biblical mandate there that a dad provides for his home. But if you really flush out and study that passage, if you really want to know what it's referring to, it's actually referring to widows and their children. Look it up later on. Look, I don't care if you look it up now. Widows is the first application, widows and children. That's the first application. And what I believe he's saying there is if you don't take care of your own, you don't really, you don't really understand the mercy and compassion of God. Now, conversely, we flush it out. All right, dads, you should provide for your families. It is, it is a priority. We are called to do that. But that is not a greater priority than serving God. They're not, in, they're not in competition with, with each other. But I have observed dads and moms who grab that verse and say, well, there, because of that, therefore I will not come to church. My family is my first priority. Spending time with them, providing for them, supporting them. I don't mean monetarily. I mean now um, in a... Uh, in a um, uh, emotional sense, supporting them. This would include um, the helicoptering of parents, the lawnmower parents. The, the lawnmower parent is a term uh, describing parents who will mow down every opposition for their children in life. All right, And they believe, well, my priority in life is to make sure my children have an easy path through life. Easy path. Now, as parents... Will we ever mow down some obstacles for our children? Sure we will. Sure we will. Absolutely. If they're tonight at the house, uh, you know, a, a lion, all right, comes into my house, I will do my best to protect my children and my wife. Right? Now the odds of a lion coming in are very, very slim. Okay. But I would do that. And, and you would as well. But making them an easy path is not my highest priority. Yet there are parents who that is their highest priority. They revolve around making sure their kids have every experience, that their kids do everything to make sure they get just as much as, as, as Sally over here and make sure everything's got to be equal because you know what, you know, Jimmy over here, it's got to be fair, it's got to be right. Uh, maybe you watched this in a secular setting. The other day I saw a place where a ref was um, getting yelled at by a parent. And apparently one of the parents either spit or something, and the, the ref swung at them, and it was an AAU basketball game. And, uh, boy, next thing you know, the parent body slams the ref, and they're all up in arms back and forth. And you, maybe you've seen this, these, these crazy YouTube videos, and it'll be in wrestling where the mom is screaming at the refs because it wasn't fair, and, and he, missed, he missed a foul. Uh, for a, a few years, I refed soccer. At that time, I was coaching the boys' soccer here, so I refed girls' soccer in, uh, in the public, public venue. And I um, had a, one time I was at a tournament, and there was a mom just, just jawing over there. Now, it could have been a dad, but it was a mom that day, okay? So no offense, ladies or men, it just happened to be a mom that day. And she was just jawing, had very little understanding of the game of soccer, okay? But she had the loudest mouth on the field, I had picked up a tip from an older ref. I'd watched him one time, and so after about five minutes, I stopped the match, and all the girls are watching. I walked over to the mom. I picked this up from another, from a ref who's ref here sometimes, actually, men, uh, ladies, and uh, I said, ma'am, I said, um, you're talking an awful lot, and uh, 
you're not exactly helping the game, so you have a choice to make. All right, either you can be quiet on the sidelines and we can finish the game, or you can go to your car and we can finish the game. All right? And as a ref has full authority to do that, and she said, uh, she said, yes, sir, I'll be quiet. And she was quiet the rest of the game. But her view was that no matter what happened, no matter who she ran over, all right, it was going to be fair for her daughter. And whenever she perceived to be incorrect, that's what she screamed about. Or the third one now, down, I will just navigate life as it comes. For some people, they're just like, you know what, whatever happens, happens. I have no plans, I have no uh, directions, I'll just take life as it comes. And understand, there must be an importance of a biblical worldview. Everything must be interpreted through the lens of the word of God. I don't want to just hand, navigate life as it comes. We ought to look ahead and have our steps directed by the Lord. Or number four tonight, in the deceptive thoughts, my commitments to men are greater than my commitments to God. My commitments to men are greater than my commitments to God. Are you saved tonight? Are you a Christian? Right now, my wife has been going through this knee replacement, and I've been doing everything. Everything. No doubt about it. I'm doing everything. Now, your lady's like, oh, it's about time. What I, my response is, I did this before. What's the difference? It's the same way. It's not. I'm just kidding about that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. And my wife and I were talking recently, and she was feeling badly. She goes, you're doing this, and I'm, you know, driving this, and then driving kids here. And, I'm, and I, I said, but honey, honey, this is what I signed up for. The last time I checked, I, I committed for better or for worse. For richer, for poor, in health and some sickness. No. For whatever reason, Pastor Let when he did the vows that, or no, you, I don't, did you do the vows or, or, Pastor, or Pastor Saunders did? One of you did the vows. Whatever. They, they did the whole sickness and health thing. All right. I got snookered into that one. But I made a vow that day. And as far as human commitments, that is the greatest human commitment I have ever made. Greatest human commitment I've ever made to my wife. But my commitments to God must be greater than any human commitments to men. Commitments to, I put some thoughts down there, commitments to a sports team, commitments to work, commitments to a family event, or to family events. I hear people say, well, I, I gave my word. Yes, but you also committed to Jesus Christ. You also committed to Jesus Christ. And the Bible commands me in a few things. Let's look at the correct response briefly tonight. What does the correct response look like? Two verses for us. Joshua 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. If you don't want to serve God, just choose today who you want to serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And Joshua was saying, listen, you can choose, he said, listen, choose whoever you want to. In one sense, if I can translate what Joshua is saying is, listen, if you don't want to serve God, then just pick somebody. Just pick somebody. If you want it to be to the sun god, or to the moon god, or to the mouse god, choose somebody. The ones your father served on the other side, uh, the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says this, but as for me and my house, as for me and my house, let me tell you my priority. As for me and my house, let me tell you my number one commitment. We will serve the Lord. You know what that looked like for Joshua. Looked like a fight the next day. Looked like battles. It looked hard. It looked like opposition. It looked like not everyone would say, hey, that's a great idea. It looked like not everyone would understand. But he said, listen, just so you understand where I'm at and do what you have to do, but we are going to serve the Lord. Colossians 1 verse 18. And he, that is Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things. Now, you may not realize this, not having a doctorate 
in Greek. But let me help you. All things means all things. I don't have a doctorate in Greek. I figured out all things by reading my Bible. You know what all things includes? Sports. Eating. Work. Family. Husband, wife. And all things. That in all things. What does the verse say? Read it with me. He might have the preeminence. First place. The first priority. We must have a correct understanding of God given priorities. Let me give you the four. I've given you them before because these are my four as I have laid them down in my life. And I'll tell you my process. That there's a blank there at the bottom of your page. And if you could, write in that blank, God. Write God right there. Next page is a verse. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. We must love God above everything and everyone else. Now she wouldn't, but if Doreen were to come tonight before the service and say, listen, you know what, J.D.? I don't want you to go to church. Would you just stay home with me tonight? My knee's a little sore. Just please, please stay home. I love my wife. I'm doing everything. Of course, I'm not. But I'm supposed to love God more. That's what my Bible says. The Bible says. Again, thankfully, dream would not put me in that spot. But I, but I have to love God even above my love for my wife. Even above for that. God must be first in my life and in your life. Above everything else. Above, above relaxation. Above my job. Above my elderly parents. Figuratively speaking, of course, not, not realistically. Above everything, God must be first. God has to be first. Above feelings, my own or someone else's, God must be first. That is a God-given, biblically mandated and shown scriptural position. God is first. What that means is, when I get up, I say, God, I serve you. When I lay down, God, I'm still yours. God, what do you want? God, what do you desire in my life? God, is this the position you want me to take? Boy, I want it. I, I love the, the pay raise, and I love the promotion and the notoriety. But God, what do you want? God, this is the reaction that I want to have. But Lord, what do you want me to have? Has your word given any instruction? on There must be a priority for God himself. It applies to every single area of our life. There is no area in my life that is not touched by God. It cannot be. Remember that verse, Colossians 1.18, that in all things, every area, every area, from where I shop, to what clothes I buy, to how I eat, exercise or not exercise, to entertainment, to media, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And if that seems like a hard concept, I would challenge you to get back in your word and say, God, help me make you first. If it feels like you have to pick and choose, then God's not really first. He may be first sometimes. He may be first occasionally. But my Bible says that he must have the preeminence in all things. And I'm supposed to love him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. And that is the first commandment. Number two. Second priority. Second level. My spouse. If applicable. Little caveat there. Spouse. Genesis 2.24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I appreciate the concept in that verse where you take the strongest bond known in nature that is the bond of a child to a parent. I can change my name, I can change the country that I live in. I could 
tattoo myself all the way up. I could lose arms and legs and, and all these body parts. I could lose all these things. I could be burned and be disfigured and you couldn't recognize me. But they could test my DNA. They could test my parents' DNA and they could confirm, all right, beyond a reasonable doubt that these are the parents of J.D. Howell, right? Strongest bond known in nature. And the Bible says you cut that and you make something even stronger. The only thing that shows the picture of Christ and the church, according to Jesus Christ, is a husband-wife. It shows that. God is number one, my spouse, in my case, Doreen, is number two. And they must remain in that, in that order. Doreen can't take over God. God must be over Doreen, my spouse. Number three, family. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 7 through 9, we've looked at this passage before. The instructions of parents to train their children. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. Of course, the verses we began with, Psalm 127, Ephesians 6, 4, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Family is number three. And then number four, other responsibilities. Some spots there for later on. You can list other responsibilities you may have. Job, ministry, friends, service, sports, possessions. Two last statements. Typically, responsibility, responsibilities are often more about timing than position. I, at least twice a year, take some time to evaluate my life. Where I sit down by myself. My wife's not there. Kids aren't there. Staff's not there. I'm in a quiet place. I try to get alone with God, just me and God. And I evaluate a self-evaluation of my life. And I ask myself this question, all right, sometimes verbally, sometimes internally, sometimes I write it down. Am I keeping those four things in order? Maybe your life is like mine where things want to creep out of place. And all of a sudden I find maybe the boy's soccer schedule creeping into family. And we made a commitment to the soccer team, but that's under God. I made that commitment first. It's under Doreen. I made that commitment first, right? It's under my family. I got them first. And so, boy, this one's creeping. I better bring it back down. Hey, we've been really doing a lot of stuff with the kids. Am I making, are they creeping above Doreen? Now, I say Doreen is, is number two in my life. Does she think she's number two? Does she feel like she's number two? Or have I allowed the kids to kind of creep up there? Come on, moms and dads. Sometimes kids can, can take over in a household. You may not realize this, but they're needy. They are needy. A lot of take, take, take. Not much give, give, give. You guys take, take, take a lot. I, d I do tell my kids that, by the way. And, and children, hey, teenagers, let me give you a thought real quick, all right? Parents, plug your ears. Children, here's, here's the thing. You naturally, by being children, are takers. All right? You don't pay for consumers. You don't pay for toilet paper. You don't pay for hot water. You take. Your parents will ask you to give some things back. Typically not rent. Right? They'll ask you to do things like, like clean up and do dishes and, and, and trash and like little chores, right? Your parents all do that. Laundry sometimes, right? They're asking, in a sense, to give because you're naturally takers. It's your spot in life. One day you'll be a giver with the Lord's help, and, but, but you're naturally takers. They're going to ask you to give. So do me a favor, and please, the Lord, don't also take with a bad attitude and suck the joy out of the house. All right, so your parents will say, hey, could you take out the trash, right? And you could, with a joyful spirit, you could give not only the trash back, but a joyful spirit back. Where you encourage your parents' hearts. You're like, wow, you know what, they're really doing well. But sometimes what happens because you have a bad attitude, not only do you take in the fiscal sense, in the time sense, in the stress sense, but now you're not only like barely giving in this sense, and you're sucking the joy right out. Sucking the joy right out. Just a thought for you. I want you to think about that. You can write that down. All right? Don't take more than I'm supposed to out of the house. You got that? Okay, teenager, that's for you guys. But kids are, kids are needy, right? They, they can do this. This is why, all right, couples, you see couples who have been together for 25, 30 years while the kids are home, the kids leave the house and the couples get divorced. So they wake up one morning and realize, I don't like you anymore. I don't love you anymore. All this time we had these children 
they were a higher priority than we were. I try to evaluate that. I say, wait a second. I love the kids. Just on a side note for, for couples, um, have date night. Schedule it. Schedule it. My wife and I were fairly scheduled people because of the church responsibilities and life and school and all this. I think we run about 13 calendars between the two of us. You say, that sounds nuts. It is sometimes. Keep it all straight. You know what we do? We schedule, actually my wife does this for us, she schedules date nights. We're going on date night. I spent a lot of money as a young parent on babysitters. Money well spent. Money well spent. Many people in here have babysat my kids. Give me good reports and bad. And I'm, I was happy to spend the money. We try to have at least two date nights a month where it's just me and her going out. And what are you doing? Sometimes just get away from the kids. All right? Just, just, just to make sure that I like her and she likes me. <laughs> Sometimes we come back early. I'm just kidding. <laughs> nope, not now. We'll try again in a month. Let's <laughs> see if this works. I have the regular checkups and honest evaluation. Because last tonight, a challenge for all of us, I want to raise my kids with the correct priority for God. I hope that the time they spend in my home, that they see not a perfect dad. They're not going to see a perfect dad. I want them to see a dad that loves God. That God is first. All right. And through that, in a practical, observable way, we say, kids, you know what? It's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So this is going to get set right over here. This is not going to be first priority. God is going to be first. If I'm in special service, all right, kids, we're there. We're, we're going to be there, and we're going to have a good time. I'm not grumbling on the way to church. I'm having a good time. This is great. Sure, there's times I drive here, and my body is tired. Anybody else that way? You ever come to church and your body's tired? But I'm still happy to come to church. Happy to be with God's people in the house of God, with the people of God, to worship God. I want to raise my kids with the right priority. I want to give them the observable Example. Maybe this is what it looks like, kids. Lord, help us as Christians to put you first. Lord, maybe in a practical sense, make decisions in all things that you would have the preeminence. Lord, help us in our families. In Jesus' name, amen.